They all saw it on TV. It must be real. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's the problem. And uh, I saw it on TV. <clears throat> Therein leaves the problem. People think uh, they see it on TV. It must be real. They saw they saw the moon landing on TV. I saw it. I watched him get out. <laughs>
by falsely stringing police tape in the background. The shot featured reporter Lindsay Davis in Woodruff, South Carolina, where a woman was allegedly held captive in a storage container by a registered sex offender. Behind Davis, yellow police tape can be seen with the words, Sheriff's line do not cross. A wider photograph of the scene shows that police tape was actually just attached to some ABC camera equipment to enhance the scene. Dateline NBC, a primetime news program, airs a story in 1992 entitled, Waiting to Explode. The story includes footage demonstrating that a line of trucks produced by General Motors readily explode on impact. To see for ourselves what might happen in a side impact crash, Dateline NBC hired the Institute for Safety Analysis to conduct crash demonstrations. Unlike GM tests, the fuel tanks were filled with real gasoline. Look what happened. At impact, a small hole was punctured in the tank. According to our experts, the pressure of the collision and the crushing of the gas tank forced gasoline to spew from the gas cap. The fuel then erupted into flames when ignited by the impacting car's headlight. After the program airs, one of the firemen at the taping of the crash contacts GM. The conversation inspires a full-scale investigation. Three months later, NBC is forced to reveal their role in fabricating the news. NBC's contractor did put incendiary devices under the trucks to ensure that there would be a fire if gasoline were released from the truck's gas tank. We said the crash, quote, forced gasoline to spew from the fuel cap, end quote. GM says since the gas cap was the wrong cap for the GM filler tube and because the gas tank was overfilled, the cap came off when the impact occurred. We agree with GM that we should have told our viewers about these devices. The Dateline reporter, however, said, quote, at impact, a small hole was punctured in the tank, unquote. GM has now x-rayed that tank and found no hole. We acknowledge the placing of the incendiary devices under the truck was a bad idea from start to finish. That's our new policy, and we'll be right back. Look at a pyramid. In the first couple layers, the really eager, hard-working young journalists are out there trying to get the stories, trying to make a name so they can move up that pyramid. Well, the further they move up the pyramid, uh, the more they realize that, uh, you know, the outlets really aren't interested in major news that rocks the boat. The boat Charles refers to belongs to those at the top of the pyramid, where the interests of the media outlets are quietly defined. The year is 1917 and Representative Oscar Calloway enters a disturbing statement into the U.S. congressional record. The statement reveals why J.P. Morgan interests hired 12 high-ranking news managers. The 12 were asked to determine the most influential newspapers in America. They were to figure out how many news organizations it would take to control generally the policy of the daily press of the United States. The 12 found it was only necessary to purchase the control of 25 of the greatest papers. An agreement was reached. The policy of the papers was bought and an editor was placed at each paper to ensure that all published information was in keeping with the new policy. Soon, that policy would be defined by a front group formed by J.P. Morgan and his colleagues. In fact, Morgan's personal attorney was founding president of the organization, the Council on Foreign Relations. Today, the CFR maintains that its goal is to increase America's understanding of the world. However, the actual objective of this highly exclusive club is revealed by the rare admissions of the insiders themselves. In the early 60s, a Georgetown University professor collects information for a book favorable to the network of powerful men who founded the CFR. 
For two years, Professor Carol Quigley is allowed to examine the confidential papers and secret records of this network. Quigley reveals that these men aim to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. In short, they seek total and quiet control of the entire world. And the CFR is their most visible conduit for carrying out that agenda. CFR members include America's wealthiest tycoons, as well as the highly placed elite in government, academic institutions, tax-exempt foundations, and the establishment media. Ruling Class Journalists, written by Richard Harwood, describes the CFR membership as the ruling establishment in the United States. The Washington Post article boasted that news reporters who are CFR members do not merely analyze and interpret foreign policy for the United States, they help make it. Who are these policy makers? Many of their faces are familiar. NBC's Tom Brokaw, CBS's Dan Rather, ABC's Barbara Walters, Jim Lehrer of PBS, William F. Buckley of National Review, media mogul Rupert Murdoch, owner of the giant multifaceted News Corporation. These media heavyweights, and many others like them, are members of the CFR. Powerful corporations are also invited to become members. At the close of the 20th century, CFR influence presided over far-reaching consolidations of media control. In 1995, CFR members Michael Eisner of Disney and ABC's Thomas Murphy merged their media empires. Soon after the merger, the Disney-ABC empire becomes a CFR corporate member. In the year 2000, the world's largest internet service provider, America Online, joins forces with Time Warner, one of the world's largest news organizations. The CEOs favoring the move are CNN's Thomas Johnson and Time Warner's Gerald Levin, both CFR members. Once again, another media giant is created under the shadow of CFR influence. Today, an elite handful of individuals define the agendas that are supported by the empire of establishment news. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? We do have people who submit pieces to other two American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks. This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. 